afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Jessica Wilson, and I'm standing in for Josie Badger. Um, and we would like to welcome you to the webinar, Smart Homes Made Simple, with our wonderful presenter, Susan Takao and Kirby G. Smith. Susan is the Chief Executive Officer at Pennsylvania Assistive Technology Foundation, and Kirby is the President of Sun Curb Ideas, and we're looking forward to their webinar today. It's a very interesting topic, so let's get started. And Jessica, thank you so much oh. for introducing us. This is Josie, um, and I appreciate everyone's help um, getting this started. So the reason for today's webinar, I am honestly very excited about it, is that um, probably a few years ago, I would have had no thoughts or idea that we would be presenting on smart home technology or technology in general, because I was the anti um, technology is. Um, and I remember how difficult disability specific technology was growing up. Nothing worked the way that it should. It didn't accommodate me. And it was so expensive. And so this move into more inclusive universal design for technology is a huge step in allowing all individuals the ability to be able to access technology to change the environment around them. Um, and I presented with Kirby this summer at the Pennsylvania Transition Conference, and we talked about the exact thing you're going to hear about today, but we realized how much very few of us knew about what was available and how reasonably priced it is, and the multitude of ways that you can pay for these supports. Um, and just a couple of years ago, when my husband and I bought our house, I we moved in on Christmas Eve, um, not the best life decision, but my husband gave me a box for Christmas morning, and it was a hub for the assistive devices like the Alexa um, from Amazon, and a light bulb, and let me tell you, initially, I was not thoroughly thrilled about a light bulb for Christmas. However, I had no idea how this technology would truly change my life and my independence. So I want to thank Kirby and Susan for joining us, and I want to turn it over to Susan. Or Kirby. <laughs> Yeah, this webinar will focus on defining and learning about smart home technology and how these devices can be integrated into your home and work environments to enhance independence, safety, and quality of life. Funding resources for the acquisition of smart home devices will also be discussed. Now, Susan. <clears throat> Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, I will, we will go for the first slide where there is a picture, there are three pictures. Um, and the first picture in the upper left is a smartphone that's operating through an application on the phone, lights that are underneath a counter in the kitchen. To the right is a woman who is coming out of her apart, her house. And by her door, she has a ring. Um, and above the door, you'll see a camera. And then to the bottom left is a wonderful uh, a snapshot of a video from Saturday Night Live, if anyone wants to go on it, called Amazon Silver. Um, but it's just it's to illustrate how smart home devices are becoming much more commonplace. Next slide. 
So the way that Josie and Kirby and I started working together is that we in Pennsylvania Assistive Technology Foundation uh, were successful grantees from the um, Pennsylvania Developmental Disabilities Council and every state has a DD council that is supposed to promote new projects within a state to help support people with disabilities to be more independent and integrated naturally into the communities. So what we wanted to do was to raise awareness and have a greater understanding about generic smart home technology devices and how they can help people with disabilities live more independently and safely in their own homes. And just as Josie said, um, how important it is that generic technologies also be part of our conversation. They are usually easier to work with and certainly a lot cheaper. Uh, next. As part of our uh, project, we would like people to follow us and to learn more about smart home technology. So we have several hashtags, a website, Facebook, and Instagram. And the website is smarthomesmadesimple.org. Facebook, it's at Smart Homes Made Simple. And if you just follow those two, you will um, see, uh, you'll have articles in which you can read. You'll have a dictionary. We've included a dictionary so that we can all be speaking the same language. For example, what exactly are smart home devices? Kirby, you'll hear it's home automation. Physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists have often used the word environmental control. If you go into Lowe's or Best, Best Buy and you ask for environmental controls, you're not going to get a uh, uh, someone who can help you and understand what you're talking about. So that's why we've put, as an example, a dictionary on the website so that we can have a common language. If people have questions, you can ask it there and one of us will answer. Um, so please follow us. Next slide. Again, the learning objectives for today's webinar in the next 40 minutes. We trust that you will have a better understanding of assistive technology and how generic smart home technology plays a role. You'll know how smart home devices can be integrated into a home to enhance independence, safety, and quality of life for individuals with disabilities. You will be able to identify ways that smart home devices can help in transition and also employment. And lastly, you will know how possible know the possible funding resources for the acquisition of smart home devices. Next slide. And why are smart home devices so incredibly important? They're important for several reasons. Muted. Notably, they help an individual with a disability be independent. It, they can help someone have an improved quality of life. And perhaps most importantly, it gives someone autonomy. And I think uh, Josie can speak to this, Kirby and his wife can speak to it, and I also have an adult son, Michael, who lives in his own home, and the um, autonomy it gives him is undescribable. So um, because Kirby and I are not in control of these slides. They're being managed by Miriam and Jessica. We were um, unable to put together a video, to put on a video and make sure it works for you. But in order to get a fuller picture about how all people with disabilities and people without disabilities can use smart home devices, there is a video that we put the link up under the chat. Um, that shows a, a man named Richard, who Kirby set up and installed some smart home devices in his new apartment. Richard has cerebral palsy and he moved from a nursing home into his own apartment. And you can see his video if you go and click on that website. Um, it's English.org. Go under Programs and Services. 
Then there's a new tab, Adapted Technology Program. And the last tab is Smart Home Technology in Action. And there you will see Richard, who really is showing the world that by using smart home devices, he is able to monitor who comes in and out of his home and to let people into his home. He can turn on and off lights, listen to music, hear jokes, all through the use of smart home technology. So Kirby, I'll turn it over to you. And the next slide. Hello, this is Kirby speaking. Uh, so waiting for the next slide. Alrighty. So before I launch into uh, describing the um, the type of devices that are out there and their cost and how they're set up, I want to sort of go backwards a little a little bit and discuss why all of a sudden you have this explosion of uh, smart home technology and voice control systems. Uh, if we go way back, the last time the home has been modified and changed so drastically it was probably during the late 1800s, early 1900s. And what drove that change um, in the home was everyone being connected um, and having power lines installed, in other words, electricity. So with the advent of electricity being introduced to the home, suddenly you had uh, things being introduced such as electric light bulbs, uh, uh, ovens, uh, powered refrigerators, and things like that. And the reason that occurred is that with homes being wired and connected, manufacturers saw an opportunity where instead of building one large system, such as a large refrigeration system that would be at a plant and then you would ship the ice out to the people, you could build smaller versions of it, have it installed into a home, and have a larger market. So we look at today, and if you were to move into a home, and your home did not have a washing machine, a dryer, a dishwasher, a refrigerator, and things like that, you would think something is wrong with that home uh, because they've become so integral to what a home is. During the light, late uh, 70s, uh, many manufacturers decided it would be a great idea if there were a way for the actual home devices or home systems to be able to talk to each other. They didn't have a, a standard, so what was created was called X10. So X10 was a way that if I was a manufacturer doing one piece of equipment and you were working on another one, we would have a common language and a common method for the two devices to maybe communicate with each other, such as um, having a remote control turn on the microwave or a TV. Once again, it was a radical idea at the time. Now we, it's normal to us. Um, if you buy a television that doesn't have a remote control, you would think something is wrong with it. X10, however, was kind of limiting, and it still exists today, but you find that the, the only ones who are still using it, interesting enough, are occupational and um, other therapists. And the way it's used is that um, before the advent of Alexa and other products such as um, Google Home, you might see what's called a, a jelly bean, it's a switch. And by hitting that switch, it might send a radio signal out or it might physically be wired to a light and would turn it on. So for someone with limited mobility, um, X10 is still being used but is dying quickly um, as a standard way in which you can still control some devices. Um, so the main thing to, to take from that is that X10 was a protocol and over time newer more powerful protocols would be developed, especially around radio signals. Next slide, please. So the big change that has occurred recently is uh, by 2012, you have smartphones and tablets becoming um, readily available. At the same time in the home market, uh, we have uh, certain radio protocols that have become normal. Uh, we all don't even think uh, twice about it. So the ones that you're probably most familiar with are, for example, Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi uh, is a fairly strong signal. It can travel distances, and so hence uh, most of our uh, communication systems right now are based on Wi-Fi. 
Bluetooth, on the other hand, is a type of radio signal that does not require a lot, a lot of power. The chip can be very tiny and consume very little power. And so that's what you see in things like headphones and speakers. Um, when you start to get into uh, smart home systems, the uh, two big systems that they're built around are Zigbee and Z-Wave. And later on, I'll go into what the difference is there. The main thing to keep in mind is that they both use what's called a mesh technology, which means uh, one device can talk to the next device, can talk to the next, next device, which uh, gives me the ability in my home to put in one hub, and then every device I put in strengthens, strengthens the signal, speeds it up, and makes everything work better. So in other words, the more smart home products you put in, the better the signal becomes, the better they all work. Uh, the next big thing that happens is around 2015, Apple Siri, for the first time, gets consumers used to the concept that you talk to a device and it talks back. Um, it may not have always worked for all of us, but you wouldn't think it's entirely strange to see someone turn around and speak to their phone, uh, giving a command to a system. Then you have the huge change that occurs where Amazon comes out with their Echo, and for the first time, you had a reliable device it took very simple to, uh, commands, and it could deliver something to you that actually worked. So uh, Amazon's Echo quickly supplanted Siri as sort of the gold standard of uh, a voice command type of system. Uh, and I will go into later why Amazon was motivated to do this. But the main thing to remember is that they did two smart things. One, they created a speaker um, that can receive commands and be updated easily. Two, they uh, use an open platform wherein you didn't have to pay a license if you use their technology um, to plug into the system. So this quickly led to the adoption of uh, Amazon Alexas in a variety of different industries and types of devices. And so right now, Amazon Echo uh, has the largest number of devices um, that can be supported by the system out there. It's quickly followed by uh, Google Home and other systems that are coming out, such as Cortana. Uh, but by far, um, Amazon system uh, supports the most different uh, devices. And when you back that up with artificial intelligence, what's happened now is a lot of things have come together. The manufacturing of these devices is extremely cheap. So when I first started installing, for example, smart light bulbs, they might run $60. Now those same light bulbs cost $8. Uh, cameras, which started off at $300, are now down to, depending on the type of intelligence you want, anywhere from $250 to $49. And the voice control system, the Alexas, um, what makes it so great, and the same with Google Home, it's a one-time purchase. And over the years, because they're based on a cloud system, they can be upgraded, enhanced, new features added, and you do not have to replace the technology. So because of all of this, we have a situation where the uh, smart home market is projected to reach 53 billion by 2022. And um, by all indicators, it's gonna exceed that very easily. Next slide, please. Uh, so just to get some very, very quick background uh, about how I ended up doing this, uh, my wife was injured four years ago and it left her living with quadriplegic. So we were on vacation. She was struck behind the, uh, her, just underneath her head on her neck. And it left her paralyzed. And during the time that she was in therapy and we were adjusting to a new life and having to get our house ready, uh, we thought that there would be an organization or a place to go where you could get information on um, how to use technology if you were living with some kind of disability. And that didn't exist. So about a year later, we decided, okay, why don't we give this a go? And we formed a, a company to do just that. So we had certain rules when we went into this. One was to keep it simple but smart. And what that means is that uh, if we go in and we do an installation, uh, you should be able to do it, walk away. You don't need a lot of instructions on how to use it. You don't need tons of complicated support around it. And it should be something that's just in incredibly intuitive. 
Also, to distinguish it from adapted technology, it should be something that everyone in the household could use. So you move from, I'm not going to use the word stigma, but the idea that this is a special piece of equipment for the person in my family who has a disability to we all are receiving this and it, it improves all of our lives. And hey, by the way, the person that's living with a disability, um, it, it becomes even more important. We wanted everything to be inexpensive. So uh, everything that's used in our company is off the shelf. You can order it from Best Buy, Amazon, uh, Target. And um, it's relatively cheap. It's affordable. People have options. They can go in and add very simple technology to their home for less than two to three hundred dollars or they can go all out and i've done homes that have been as expensive as seven thousand dollars to set up um, and finally when it comes to support once again uh if support is needed it should be backed by major companies that have if, if not 24 7 help desk at least a help desk that's available during normal working hours um, and once again not that much training needed uh, so everything we've done has been built around voice control systems. Primarily, I support uh, Amazon Echoes. And the main reason for that, I get the question, uh, what's better, Google Home or Amazon Echo? They both do very, very similar things. Uh, they just do it slightly differently. So when, if people want to use it more as a 100% assistant, and to look up things or whatever, I recommend the uh, Google Home. But if it comes to smart home controls, right now uh, Amazon still has the, the edge there. So um, this allows us to once again have the options of more devices to choose from, and that's the reason why I built everything around um, Amazon Echo. Uh, everything can also be controlled through smartphones and tablets, and uh, there are all kinds of amazing other options out there now for controlling systems um, that are coming out. Uh, and so we start to move into the house and I wanna move away from terminology such as uh, environmental controls um, that tends to be used by hospitals and larger organizations. I wanna move away from the idea of adaptive tech because one of the things that made it very difficult for my wife and I when we were first setting up the home is we kept Googling and looking up adaptive tech, and we were getting things like ramps. Uh, we were getting um, the hospital-type control systems, industry-type control systems, and later on we discovered that where someone might use the term environmental control when they're talking about temperature, you're really talking about a thermostat or a smart thermostat. Uh, so I'm going to start shifting. I can go to the next slide um, to discuss um, how everything comes together. So everything is built around uh, the uh, Amazon Echo, and my favorite out of all of them is the Echo Show because it gives visual feedback. And if anyone's been watching the Christmas commercials, you're probably getting, getting inundated because uh, now Google has come out with a similar device as well as Facebook. Um, and what makes it the, the, the centerpiece of this is it does several different things. One, it becomes an assistant. So it's very easy to uh, tell it to set up a date for you for your meeting. It's very easy to tell it to do a reminder if you have to take your medication. If you have a camera outside, it's very easy to see the outside just by telling the system, show me the, the entryway. Uh, the system also allows you to communicate very easily. So for instance, I'll speak for myself, uh, it's my conference call system. All I have to do is turn to it, tell it the name of anyone that's in my address book, it automatically downloads that information. So if I were to say, call John Smith, it would say John Smith Home or Mobile, I would say Home, and it calls John Smith. The one thing it does uh, that's unique from, believe it or not, Siri, which is on Apple, or the Google um, version of that, is that you can hang up. <laughs> so ironically, if you use a phone and try to give a voice command to make a call, you can't hang up. Using uh, these type of systems, such as Google Home and the Echo Show, or a regular Echo, you can. Um, the system also becomes your way of 
activating emergency system. So for example, I could have a $30 uh, V-Wave uh, siren that I can get from, for example, Home Depot. I connect that to the system, and now I have a way if I hang that outside since it's waterproof, I can alert the neighbors if I need help. And finally, um, when it comes to home monitoring, is the house safe? Is there security in the house and everything? These devices give you that kind of uh, security to know that your environment is safe, as well as giving you information and feedback so you can see what's happening. So for example, I can, uh, I've set up a home where verbally they arm the house to let them know that they're still in the house, but they want the motion detectors, the cameras and everything to report if there's anything strange going on and the system will alert them as well as give an, uh, a notification to uh, family and other people such as caregivers that help may be needed. Next slide, please. So if we start to zero in on what it does uh, for someone living with a disability, um, the first thing that these systems do is give a person control of their door. So uh, a, a large portion of my uh, clients have been paralyzed or suffering from spinal cord injury or other types of diseases uh, or disabilities that limit their mobility. And the first thing that goes with that is your ability to control your front door. So if you are bedridden, you have no way to know what's happening at the front of the house or the back of the house or to control who's coming in and out. So if we start, you have the uh, classic automatic door opener. Uh, the one difference we've done there is we've added a voice control system to it so that uh, from your bed or other room, you can tell it to open the door. Next, you have a camera. Cameras can be installed um, at the entryway as well as around the house. So for example, I have a client, uh, when she was injured and left paralyzed, um, they added a extra room to the house and thought it would be great if they surrounded it with windows looking out on the garden. Unfortunately, at night, uh, that left her in her room looking out the windows thinking she saw someone move or just something didn't look right and she had no way to check on it without calling for help. And she often didn't want to trouble her uh, caregivers or her aides. Uh, she didn't want to look paranoid, but she had no way to check herself. So by putting the cameras around um, her bedroom looking outside, she's able to to say to, for example, her Echo Show, show me the West Garden and see out there. The cameras see in the dark. Um, they also automatically detect human figures, but they can say, I see a person as opposed to I see motion. Um, and, and she's also able to actually communicate through it. So let's say she saw the neighbor moving there. She could actually speak to the neighbor through the camera. Next, we move down to a smart lock. So, uh, for many of my clients, they live in a situation, especially if they live in an apartment, where they have one aide leave and another one coming, and they don't want to give the aide the actual keys uh, because the aide may only be working with them for, let's say, a month or two. What a smart lock does, um, as opposed to the situation where that first aide leaves and has to leave, leave the door open, a smart lock allows you to give someone uh, virtual keys, they punch in the code, when they punch in the code on the lock, it can inform you that uh, the lock has been unlocked. It could also inform family members, friends, or others so that they can kind of keep tabs on who's going in and out of the door. You can also lock the door remotely as well as unlock it. Uh, so from laying in bed, I'm able to see what's going on. I'm able to lock and unlock the door, and I'm able to open it. And finally, if someone is at the door and needs to get your attention, something like a ring doorbell, and there's a variety of different ones out right now. Um, they're all very competitive, um, offers very similar functionality, and usually start $200 and go down from there. Um, what the ring doorbell does is that if you press the button on the ring doorbell, your Echo Show will say to you, someone is at the door. You can say to the Echo Show, show me who's at the door. It'll display who's at the door, and you can also talk to the person standing there or you may be somewhere else entirely. So for example, my wife and I live in Philadelphia. We were in Florida 
Uh, we got a doorbell ring. We looked, and it was a guy from UPS, and we were able to tell him through the ring doorbell where to take the package to a neighbor uh, to drop it off. Uh, so when you combine all of these things together, you return uh, control of the door to the person who may not have the ability to answer it themselves or do it in a timely fashion. Next slide, please. When you move into the actual lim living space, uh, there are two, well, three major things that people want to have some control over. Once again, if we go to the idea that you're bedridden, it's two o'clock in the morning, you wake up and you, you're freezing. Uh, for many people, they're in that situation, they either have to uh, call an aid. Uh, for the majority of people, they kind of just live with it and get through until the morning comes and someone walks in who can um, turn the heat up for them. By putting in a smart thermostat, and once again, combining it with the voice control system, a person can ask the system, what's the temperature? It might say it is 62 degrees, and then the person laying in bed can say, raise the temperature to 72 degrees, and warm the room up on their own without having to trouble anyone. The next area of importance uh, to people is light bulbs, uh, something many of us take for granted. Um, so. I have up here a price of $30. They're actually down to $8. The ones that are $30, you can actually change the color of the light. So you take a average lamp, you put one of these smart bulbs into it, and now you have a light that can be voice controlled, and you can also dim it just by using your voice. So if I were to say dim the corner lamp to 20%, I can take the, 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 the light down very low and watch television um, in a comfortable room if I wanted to. The other big area is TV entertainment and um, using voice control. So previously, the system I used that supported the most different types of televisions, cable boxes, and DVRs was um, an Xbox One. Uh, Amazon has come out with the Fire Cube, and I've shifted my installation is now where I'm installing the fire cube. The beauty of it is the Xbox One could run you about $400. The new fire cube costs about $100. It's usually on sale and completely allows you to voice control the television. So you can say, turn, um, change the channel to CNN, change the channel to Fox. You can tell it to run Netflix. You can tell it, uh, let me see episode 21, first season of Mad Men and the cube will bring all of that up for you. Most importantly, you're not required to pick up a remote and press a button. So for example, uh, Comcast advertises they have voice control. That voice control is for mainly switching stations. Um, it does not allow you to do things like turn the TV on and off or uh, switch cable input so that I might switch from my Xbox to my uh, uh, cable. And finally, there are other types of, of devices that can go around the house. One of the issue, issues with smart light bulbs is that oftentimes caregivers, aides, people not familiar with the home who may be visiting will turn the smart bulb off. Once you turn that bulb off, it's dead until you turn it back on. So they think they're helping by turning off the light. What happens is they kill the voice control capability for it. So what you might do is put in a smart switch in the wall, especially if you have overhead lights. The smart switches can run anywhere from uh, $60 to $35. And what that does is that an aid or someone can switch the light off uh, manually, but you still have uh, voice control of the system. Also for rooms where you have multiple lights or whatever, once again, you would install a smart switch. So if I had 20 lights in the room all linked to one switch on the wall, I would simply replace the one switch in the wall to control all of those lights. Next slide, please. And this next slide is up just to sort of give you uh, an idea of um, the higher price range for many of these systems. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see what's called a hub. I highly recommend when you are setting up a smart home that you use a hub. Uh, my favorite is the Wink Hub. Amazon is advertising now that the Amazon Show uh, comes with a built-in hub, and there are others out there. I prefer the Wink because it's 
speaks the most different uh, languages, so to speak, the most different protocols. So by buying the one Wink hub, I can talk to a variety of different, um, for example, switches that are out in the market. So Lutron has their own proprietary way of communicating. It speaks that. Uh, it speaks Z-Wave. It speaks Zigbee, as well as other different types of device languages. So for a $90 investment, you're able to uh, control many things at once, as opposed to having to buy a hub for each manufacturer that puts something out. Um, so once again, if you compare it to smart things, they have a hub out, um, and people say, what is better? I, for me having to support many different types of devices, I prefer the Wink Hub, but if you were setting up your home, you're only using a certain number of devices, um, and they all work with smart things, there's no reason not to. That's entirely your decision. Next slide. Uh, Susan, you want to take this one, or you want me to do it? Sure. I, I'm well. Um, either way. Okay. Uh, well, I'll, I'll lead off with the first two, and you can speak to your personal experience with the last two. All right. <laughs> uh, okay. So when I am setting up a home, uh, that begins with an assessment where I go to the the house. I speak to the person who is uh, who has the disability. I also prefer to speak to everyone who might come in and out of that house and are there on a regular basis. Um, and the reason for that is that you cannot assume because a person has a certain type of illness or disability that they're gonna want the exact same type of system. So I can go into some homes and a person says, hey, I am totally comfortable changing my own life. It's the darn TV that bothers me. And you go into someone else's house and they say, I wanna control everything. And even though I can't drive, I want to be able to open and close the garage doors because if I have to get out of the house and I'm in my power chair, that's my quickest, fastest way to, to exit the home. So there has to always be an assessment. I'll also often get the question, what is your standard package like? There is no such thing uh, because it's based on the person who has the need. So along with the disabilities that you may be uh, uh, offering uh, solutions for, you have to know a person's abilities. So we can go two ways. You can have someone with limited hand control. They're able to pick up a phone and hold it for about an hour. They're able to work the apps easily on the phone, but they've never used a smartphone. As opposed to someone who has very limited hand motion, their phone may be bolted to the side of their chair and they're using their knuckle to tap it, but they're very comfortable with um, with smartphones, and you don't have to spend a couple of hours teaching them that. So before going in, it is very important to understand what things a person can't do, and that may include uh, disability as well as knowledge, and the things they can do. You can't make assumptions either way. Susan? All right, and then the next step is working with the individual and trying to figure out what it is that that person is trying to do. So I'll just take, give you an example of how our family worked with Kirby. Our son Michael wants to be able to control the television, and he wants to switch from one sports channel to a news channel back to a different sports channel. So I could identify uh, for Kirby what Michael wants to do, and I could describe his disability. So I could tell him that Michael does not have particularly good use of his hands, but he has a good voice and a very strong memory, and he can sequence events, so multiple steps. So that's why on your support team, having someone who then could translate what Michael wants to do into knowing the technology. So in this case in particular, Kirby knows about, is it called the fire stick that could can connect cube, right. with Michael's, the fire cube, who connect to Michael's television. And Michael's able to speak to his Amazon Echo and use this fire cube and change the television himself which then of course gives him the power of watching what he wants to watch without having to depend on someone else to change the channel for him. 
And lastly, and very importantly, is the ability to work with a person support team. Whoever those people are, whether it are family members, they are attendants, um, it's knowing that every, you know, it, it's more than one person. So it is more than just the person with the disability, but also who is in that person's life who can help do problem solving if something needs to be reset, if the problem is, you know, someone's turned off the light or um, has somehow barricaded behind too many things, the Amazon Echo, so it's not, you know, or it's near a window and they're jackhammering so the poor Amazon Echo can't hear the person who's talking. So I think it is knowing who is in that person's life so that as a team, you can work together to problem solve and make sure that these smart devices work. Um, Kirby, is there anything you'd like to add to that since you're often called upon? Um, the, 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 the biggest issue is somewhere to say, okay, what's the hardest thing to do when you go into a home and set it up? And what usually, let's say, for example, I can usually set up a home within two or three hours. Um, the, the biggest thing that can, that can stop me in my tracks is I get to the home and no one knows the Wi-Fi passcode or they have an Amazon account, but they can't remember the login. That's sort of the number one issue I might have. So I've got to one, figure out all of that, and then I'm giving the person passcodes and new accounts, um, which they rarely have to look at, but they may have to one day. For example, if they switch phones, they've got to log in again. If Apple updates the iPhone, sometimes you have to log back into the app again. You have to have a support person that's going to assist the other person in keeping track of their password and knowing where everything is. For example, I don't know what type of Comcast service I purchased, but this, they have the, the last bill over here so we can look at it and see. Uh, so the, the, the support team becomes extremely important for doing all those little things, even if it's as simple as uh, Wi-Fi went down and their router needs to be removed. Great. Thank you. Next slide, please. So now that you have heard about some of these great new devices, um, we want to talk about how do you get them paid for, because it's really not particularly fun to be talking about the magic of independence without helping somebody then be able to afford to get them. So if a smart home device is being used and can be connected to employment, then the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation, and, and every state has an Office of Vocational Rehabilitation. It may just be called VR, Vocational Rehabilitation, for short. But I know in Pennsylvania, our Office of Vocational Rehabilitation has already begun um, paying for smart home devices. An Echo or an Echo Show, for example, can help someone um, as an alarm clock, get up, tell people what time it is, tell them what the weather is, how to dress appropriately, open the door so that you can get outside, all of that kind of thing. So, of course, it is in order to be able to connect with VR, there has to be an employment goal and then identify what is the need and what is the justification. So, if you need to be preparing for what to wear outside, what better than to ask um, Alexa, for example, uh, what's the weather today? Another um, funding resource is all states have home and community-based waivers. Every state can design them differently and have different service definitions. Almost all waivers have a category, a service definition, called assistive technology. And within assistive technology, it can be, smart home devices can be called assistive technology, or for example, some states are calling them electronic devices. And then they may, some states, and I've checked several states, including Pennsylvania, they say they further define electronic systems, and it says that enables someone with limited mobility to control various appliances, lights, telephone doors, security systems, etc. So 
again, to be paid for under a waiver, you, a person with a disability, have to have several limitations, several functional limitations. Usually it is three. And be low income, um, meaning that your monthly income is approximately um, about $2,400 or less a month. Then um, there are some disability specific organizations that will provide grants for uh, technology, including smart home technology, the MS Society, United Cerebral Palsy, the affiliates to the national organization have a Bellows grant. So if you live in an area where there is a, an affiliated United Cerebral Palsy organization, the ALS Society also provides grants. And almost all states have a, um, a nonprofit that administers pooled and individual trusts. The residuals in the pooled trusts can be used to help the greater community. In Pennsylvania, for example, all of Pennsylvania is covered by what's called the Achieva Family Trust. And four times a year, um, there are grant op opportunities for up to $10,000 where someone um, can get a grant for whatever is needed to help with independence. And so Achieva, for example, will give a grant uh, for smart home technology. These types of organizations exist in all states. So it's just a question of one way to go is um, do kind of a Google search or go to your um, Assistive Technology Act program. As part of the Assistive Technology Act, 42 of 56 states and territories have an alternative financing program. Pennsylvania has one. I know we've got people on the call from New Jersey and New York. They both have uh, programs. You can find your state's alternative financing program by going onto our website, Pennsylvania Assistive Technology Foundation. I provide a link uh, that you see, or you can go under patf.us and just hit that major link of who we are, and there will be that link to the alternative financing program in your state. The alternative financing programs are programs that receive some federal money, in some cases state money, like we do, to help provide financing opportunities, low interest loans, for assistive technology. Uh, next slide, please. So what we do in Pennsylvania, and we again are one of 42 uh, programs across the country, what we do is we provide information and assistance about funding resources. We provide financial education, and you can find our financial education resources under studymoney.us. And we have two loan programs. A mini loan program from $100 to $2,000 at 0% interest and zero fees. And that's where you can buy all of these types of devices that Kirby was talking about today. And then we also uh, report credit so that in the whole scheme of employment, as you return, if you report credit, you're building a thin credit file. And when you go to look for a job and an employer pulls your credit, if you've got a mini loan from us, you will pass on to the next stage of the interview because the employer will see that you are repaying money that you've promised, that you've borrowed and promised to repay. We also have a low interest loan program a 2000 to 60000 at a flat 3.75, again, no fees. And as Kirby has talked about, he has installed smart home devices in apartments, in whole houses. So if you've got a program, an alternative financing program in your state, if you use one of those loan programs, such as our mini loan or low interest loan program, 
you will be able to um, afford to be able to install those smart homes yourself. Next slide. Alternative financing programs such as PATF, we are designed to help people of all ages, all income levels, all disabilities, and all health conditions. So when you're thinking about helping someone get the smart home devices that they need, just remember the alternative financing programs are designed by federal statute to help everyone who is a resident of their state. The only requirement is that you have an ability to repay a loan. And just to give you a hint, um, about 90% of the people we have extended loans to, and we've helped over 3,000 people, are on um, received supplemental security income, SSI. Next slide, please. These are examples of some of the uh, devices people have purchased with smart home loans. Um, iPads, computers, uh, steering hand controls, and of course, smartphones and a ring. Next slide. A larger loan, you can get hearing aids, workstations, um, such as what Lindsay has in the lower left-hand station, a picture of a desk, a whole computer system, smart home. And off to the right, a picture of an adapted vehicle. Next slide. And then an example of just showing you how affordable this can be. John is someone we worked with. Um, he has a tablet already. He saw last Thanksgiving during those mad Friday frenzies that he could get an echo show with the bonus of a smart light bulb. And he, was, he talked to his neighbor to do the installation and training and, because John can't use his hands very well. So the total loan amount that he got was $580. So for 20 months, less than two years, he was able to pay 30, he said he could pay $30 a month and he is paying on this. $30 a month, and he was able to get the Echo Show, which he wanted, the smart light bulb, and have an incredible amount of independence. Next slide, please. And lastly, um, we Kirby and I, and I'm sure Josie would concur, cannot say enough of how important these devices are to helping somebody. These are some quotes that we recently uh, received from some of the installs that Kirby did at Inglis. And you can read and say, you know, the Echo makes me more independent and secure. He didn't expect the Alexa to have a personality. It helped offset my loneliness and depression. I like being able to see who's at my door so I can ignore them. And it's a game changer. <laughs> so. I think um, what we would like to leave you with is these are exciting, affordable devices that um, have a, a, a huge impact on someone's life. And we'd like to be helpful and be a resource. Next slide. So that um, I guess our contact. Imp Unmuted. I thought our last slide, but maybe it's the next one. Um, but you we will that's our contact information so feel free to connect with us and we have a few minutes left and would love to entertain your questions so thank you yeah susan there's a question here actually two uh one question from uh, glenn maneker when setting up an individual with a smart home products how is the threat from hacking from hacking addressed or addressed. How do you address that? Sorry. Say that again, I'm sorry. How do, we, how do you address the threat of hacking? Ah, okay. The threat I can of hacking. Yeah. Right. Um, whenever you read in the, the papers about hacking, it, it's sort of a term I kind of hate. <laughs> um, uh, rarely can someone come in and just randomly sit there and figure out a way to quote unquote break into your system. So let me deal with a couple of uh, situations that have been in the news. Uh, one was uh, especially around things like baby monitors 
and some Wi-Fi routers. When people open up the box and they're setting up their system, uh, many people ignore there's usually a red or a yellow or some colored piece of paper that says the administrative uh, portion of this device uh, has a default login and a default password. So oftentimes it might be admin and the password is password. And they strongly advise you to change that immediately. Many times people ignore that, they set up the device and they go with it. So many, many homes that I've gone into where they've installed their own uh, Wi-Fi router, uh, they have ignored it. I can immediately go in and take administrative control of their Wi-Fi network and look at their system. Um, when Comcast and um, uh, Fios install systems into your home, they're aware of those problems and they've already locked down uh, many of those systems. Um, in terms of things like the Wink Hub and other types of hubs, the, the, the Smart Things Hub, to date, no one has quote unquote hacked them. They have their own built-in security, um, their own built-in ID system, so it's, it's very difficult to go in for instance, and let's say hack a light bulb. And finally, there was an incident in the papers recently about um, an Alexa recording a call and sending it out to someone. The, um, if everyone is familiar with the term butt dial, wherein you're not aware you, you sat on your phone and you had a contact up and it dials the contact, that was kind of exactly what happened on the Alexa. During the time they were talking, they gave the wake up word command, which was Alexa or Echo or Amazon or computer. And they said the words, send a message. And then they named the contact. Um, and they weren't aware that they said those sequence of words. So that one major incident that was in the news, it was kind of the equivalent of a buck dial. <laughs> um, but to date, it's, um, for, for example, when I set up people's systems, I do not use their email address, I do not allow them to create the passwords. I do both of those and then I turn the account over to them. And most people tend to keep it between me and them. And if they ever wanted to even cut me out, all they have to do is go into the, the, the core system, change the password and I'm locked out. Um, but I, I uh, totally stress security, uh, use very good passwords that have nothing to do with birthdays, people's children, parents' names, homes, or anything like that. Okay, thank you, Kiri. We have two more questions. What are the alternatives for people who have disabilities that impact their speech? This doesn't necessarily mean nonverbal. Okay, I can talk to some of that. The smart home are sensitive also to, um, if you program, uh, your phone and use ProloQ to go, it can speak to the Amazon Echo, the Amazon Show. If you go to our website, you can see a story about two people who we've written about. One person has autism and is nonverbal and is using smart home devices to help, uh, help them remember to take their medicines. So there's an alarm set, and um, the the you know Alexa is talking to Brent and telling him to take medicines, and Brent is you can see him following through. The other story is about a young man who has an intellectual disability and is using his iPod to uh, talk to the Amazon Show to find out what is the weather and what actually happened in the sports the night before. Thank you. And that, that answers probably the last question, which is what type of technology have you found to be helpful for individuals with intellectual disabilities? I, again, uh, Kirby could probably answer this as well, but this, these devices, it doesn't rely on um, someone of any sort of ability or non-ability. Um, if you are able to access them in different um, ways, and that's why it's important with the team to know the disability 
um, to understand what someone's abilities are and where they need help. But there are, I think, one challenge for some people is to imagine if you're non-speaking, how can you access some of this? And again, if you've got another device that can help talk for you, like a smartphone that's pre-programmed to say, what's the weather? Or how do you cook? Or um, you can set them up with um, qu uh, quadrants and push a button that's that's already pre-programmed to say, what's the weather, turn on my light, you can hit that and the Amazon will, or other device, it will respond. So turn on my light, you can hit that and the lights will go on or the fan will turn on. Mm -hmm. Kirby, do you have other experience? That, yeah, for, um, for people that let's say are completely immobilized, they can only use their eyes to control devices. Um, Eye gaze technologies now even have Alexa science, wherein, once again, you select something on the screen by moving your eye and settling on it, and it translates it into an Alexa command. Um, there, are, there are quite a few different innovative systems out there. It's just a matter of selecting the one that will work for you. And again, I would suggest you go on our website or on Facebook because we're uploading all the time new stories, things that we gather from other articles, as well as Kirby's doing some writing, answering questions. We'd be happy to respond individually if that's what you would like. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Kirby. And um, Susan, on behalf of the race team, OK? So I, I don't think we have okay. any more questions. We'll address them all. Okay. So don't forget okay. to complete the survey when um, when the webinar is uh, it ends. We will send you the survey. It comes from the system. So thank you for, so much for joining us today. Thank you, Susan and Kirby. It's been a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Right. Bye. Bye. Bye.